Uh, my name is Karen Rui, and today it's my pleasure to introduce the recipient of the Avanti Award in Lipids, Dr. Jean Schaefer. Dr. Schaefer has made important contributions throughout her career to our understanding of lipid metabolism. So I'd like to give you a little introduction to her, both her background and some of her work. Um, in terms of her academic career, she began with an AB in biochemistry from Harvard College, followed by a medical degree from Harvard Medical School. Uh, she was then a postdoctoral fellow at MIT and then joined the faculty at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, where she was most recently the Virginia Minich Distinguished Professor in Medicine. After 24 years at WashU, Dr. Schaefer has recently made a full circle returning to Boston, where she is currently a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Associate Research Director of the Joslin Diabetes Center. Dr. Schaefer's research has ranged from finding new genes in fatty acid transport and metabolism to the creation of important new mouse models to human clinical investigations. And I'd just like to give you a small sampling of some of her important achievements. While a postdoctoral fellow in Harvey Lodish's lab, Dr. Schaefer developed an expression cloning strategy that allowed her to develop a very, or to identify an important plasma membrane fatty acid transporter known as FATP1. For this work, she was awarded the prestigious Heinrich Wieland Award. Subsequently, in her own laboratory at Wash U, Dr. Schaefer generated novel mouse models that illuminated a link between defects in myocardial fatty acid metabolism and heart failure. The lipid-driven phenotypes of these mouse models are very similar to those occurring in hearts of patients with, with diabetes, and therefore, these models have been widely used by investigators studying cardiovascular complications of diabetes. I am personally most familiar with Dr. Schaefer's work on the mechanisms of lipotoxic tissue injury and oxidative stress. Over several years, she has used rigorous biochemical and lipidomic studies to define mechanisms of lipid-induced pathology. One key achievement has been her development of a genetic screen that allowed her to identify mutations that protect cells from lip lipotoxic injury. Uh, this genetic screen uncovered a novel and unexpected role for a class of, of small RNAs, known as snow RNAs, um, as regulators of metabolic stress. And she has used both in vitro and in vivo studies to show that eliminating expression of specific snow RNAs actually protects cells and tissues from the toxic effects of excessive lipids. Dr. Schaefer is also interested in post-lysosomal cholesterol trafficking networks and is contributing to our understanding of inherited disorders of cholesterol metabolism. So in summary, Dr. Schaefer has become widely known for her scholarship, her creative approach to science, and her significant research findings. The purpose of the Avanti Award is to recognize an individual who has made outstanding research contributions in the area of lipids. And I'm sure that you will agree after hearing her presentation today that Dr. Schaefer is truly deserving of this recognition. Congratulations. Thank you, Karen, for your very kind introduction. I am truly honored to have been selected as this year's recipient for the Avanti Award. My laboratory is interested in mechanisms that underlie the metabolic stress of lipid excess and diabetes complications. Our goal is to understand how cellular and organ level responses to the metabolic environment are regulated. It is well appreciated that diabetes is a major risk factor for obstructive atherosclerosis that causes heart attacks and strokes. However, diabetes also impairs heart muscle function. Uh, it, diabetes is associated with excess heart failure following myocardial infarction or heart attack, and heart failure can occur without underlying coronary heart disease. This graph reports heart failure-free probability over eight and a half years of follow-up in 6,000 subjects followed in the MESA study. You can see that diabetes was significantly associated with the incidence of heart failure, even after adjusting for comorbidities, such as heart attacks. Notably, the risk increased further in subjects who had both diabetes and high triglyceride concentrations. While the heart normally relies on free fatty acids as a metabolic substrate, the healthy heart is in actually a metabolic omnivore. It can also use glucose, lactate, ketone bodies, and amino acids to generate ATP. 
Work from many groups supports the notion that metabolic flexibility, that is the ability to switch between metabolic substrates, is critical for normal heart function. These carbon-11 positron emission tomography data are from a study of well-controlled type 2 diabetic women by Linda Peterson and Rob Groppler at Washington University. Compared to similarly obese subjects, those with diabetes had higher plasma-free fatty acid concentrations, and this was associated with higher rates of free fatty acid oxidation and esterification in the heart. Thus, diabetes is associated with increased free fatty acid supply to the heart, and it increases the reliance of the heart on free fatty acids as a metabolic substrate. In this study, changes in myocardial fatty acid oxidation were associated with evidence of diastolic cardiac dysfunction, shown here by the echocardiographic parameter E sub M. Thus, uh, alterations in fatty acid metabolism in the heart are associated with defects in cardiac performance. Accumulation of excess lipid in the heart can also be visualized in real time in live subjects using localized magnetic resonance spectroscopy, methods that have been pioneered by Lydia Sabaniak's group at UT Southwestern. In this CINE four chamber view, the heart muscle appears as dark gray blood in the myocardial chambers and pericardial fat appear as light gray. This rectangle here shows the location for a sample volume to quantify myocardial triglyceride content over the intraventricular septum. Spectra are collected from the myocardial tissue, gating for breathing and for the electrical activity of the heart. Using this approach, Zapaniak has shown that myocardial triglyceride levels are significantly elevated in those with impaired glucose tolerance in type 2 diabetes compared with lean controls. And this elevation in myocardial triglyceride in diabetes actually precedes the onset of type 2 diabetes. Concomitant echocardiographic studies showed that myocardial triglyceride is associated with diminished filling rates, another indicator of diastolic dysfunction. So these compelling evidence prompted my laboratory to explore the potential causal links between lipid accumulation in the heart and cardiac dysfunction. Rose Chu, a postdoctoral fellow, generated a new mouse model in which she leveraged the known function of long-chain acyl-CoA synthetase, or ACS, in import of fatty acids into cells. This enzyme partners with plasma membrane proteins to esterify and trap imported fatty acids through a process known as vectorial acylation. Rose used the alpha myosin heavy chain gene promoter to overexpress this enzyme in cardiac myocytes in the postnatal heart to increase lipid influx specifically into these cells. These micrographs show a comparison of wild type and transgenic 18 day old litter mates. You can appreciate that the cardiac myocytes are enlarged and heavily vacuolated. Oil red O staining shows abundant neutral lipid. Further analyses revealed that this lipid was actually reflected a 12-fold increase in triglyceride. In addition, Rose noted there were increases in long-chain ceramides, evidence for endoplasmic reticulum and oxidative stress, cell death, and a mononuclear infiltrate. The physiological consequences of this lipid accumulation were dramatic. Rose performed transthoracic echocardiography in anesthetized six-week-old litter mates. These M-mode panels show the structures in the anterior chest, the anterior wall of the left ventricle, the cardiac chamber, the posterior wall of the left ventricle, and structures behind the heart in each panel moving along through several cardiac cycles. Compared to the wild type heart, the transgenic heart is dilated and poorly contractile. Accumulation of lipid in this model also had a profound impact on survival. Rose isolated three transgenic lines with low, medium, and high level expression of the transgene. And in accordance with the level of expression, there was a marked decrement in survival of these animals. So this model established that lipid overload, even in the face of normal systemic glucose and fatty acid levels, could lead to heart failure. 
In humans, as well as in models like the MHC ACS mouse, steatosis or the accumulation of ectopic lipid in non-adipose tissues is in fact the sine qua non of lipid overload states. However, over time, this lipid accumulation is associated with disease. In a landmark 1994 PNAS paper, Roger Unger coined the term lipotoxicity to describe this evolution. Unger's studies uncovered a role for lipid accumulation in the pathogenesis of diabetes in the Zucker diabetic fatty rat model. We now appreciate that lipotoxicity is a likely driver of disease in other organs, such as the heart and the liver, leading to cardiomyopathy or heart failure and steatosis. To gain insights into how lipids lead to lipotoxicity, a graduate student in the lab, Laura Listenberger, developed a model system in which she incubated non-adipose cells in media containing pathophysiological concentrations of glucose and free fatty acids to mimic the type 2 diabetic state. In a variety of cell types, she observed uh, cell death shown here by caspase-3 activity. This cell death was time and dose dependent. It had features of apoptosis, and it was primarily observed as shown here with the saturated fat, long chain fatty acids such as palmitate. By contrast, comparable concentrations of monounsaturated fatty acids such as oleate were well tolerated. In collaboration with Bob Farise's lab, Laura turned to analysis of murine embryonic fibroblasts to gain insights into the differences she observed between saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. These Nile red images uh, show that in wild type MEFs that are supplemented with saturated fatty acids uh, for 12 hours, there is very little triglyceride accumulation compared to MEFs that have been supplemented with the monounsaturated oleate. Here we see robust triglyceride accumulation. Laura then examined MEFs that were deficient in diacylglycerol acyltransferase 1, the enzyme that catalyzes the final step in triglyceride synthesis. These cells had impaired ability to incorporate the oleate into triglyceride stores. Laura then used propidium iodide staining and flow cytometric analysis as a, as a readout of cell death in cells with these different genotypes. Wild type cells are sensitive to palmitate, um, it, which does not get incorporated efficiently into triglyceride stores, whereas they tolerate oleate supplementation very well and don't die. By contrast, DGAT1 nus cells are, are impaired in triglyceride synthesis and they die in response to either palmitate or oleate. Taken together, these were the first functional data that indicated sequestration of excess lipid in the triglyceride droplet is initially cytoprotective. We are interested now in what drives the transition from triglyceride storage in a safe way to lipotoxicity. Work from many groups using diverse experimental approaches has implicated lipid-driven membrane remodeling, uh, signaling, activation of enzymes for production of ROS, excessive cycles of oxidative phosphorylation at the level of the mitochondria, and production of toxic lipids such as ceramides in this process of lipotoxicity, which ultimately involves not only reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress, but also ER stress, inflammation, and cell death. To drill down on and identify the proximal regulators of this process, uh, Laura turned to a loss of function genetic screens. And she did this in Chinese hamster ovary cells, which are uh, well suited to genetic screens because they are diploid mammalian fibroblasts. She carried out limiting mutagenesis using the Rosa Beta Geo retroviral promoter trap pictured here. Following transduction with this derivative of Maloney murine leukemia virus, the proviral sequence integrates at relative random into the host genome. If and only if it integrates in close proximity to an active RNA pol 2 promoter, it traps the gene and leads to production of a fusion transcript. Uh, the, the 
in subsequent steps, the site of integration into the host genome can be identified by PCR techniques. So Laura's screen was set up that she carried out limiting mutagenesis to achieve less than one integration per cell. She selected for mutants because in the profiral cassette, there's a neomycin phosphotransferase gene. And then she selected for those mutants that were resistant to metabolic stress. She then identified the genes by PCR techniques. The phenotypes of the mutants that came out of the screen were as she might have expected. This graph shows cell death responses of the parental cells in white compared to a typical mutant shown in blue. And I'll use this color scheme again throughout my slides. You can see that the mutants were relatively protected from palmitate-induced cell death, again shown by propidium iodide positivity. But they died similar to wild-type cells in response to storosporine, actinomycin D, and camptothecan. This was expected. But what was surprising was that the initial loci identified in our screen were not obviously related to fatty acid uptake or metabolism. One striking example was the mutant in which a single proviral insertion landed within the RPL13A locus or ribosomal protein L13A. This locus includes a small globular protein that's part of the large subunit of the ribosome. It also includes four intronic small nucleolar RNAs, SNORD 32A, 33, 34, and 35A. The pre-messenger RNA that's transcribed from this locus is indeed spliced to produce a mature messenger RNA that leads to production of the protein. But from this locus, the intron lariats containing the SNO RNAs are uh, survive long enough to become debranched and undergo exonucleolytic cleavage to ma generate mature small nucleolar RNAs, or as we will call them, SNO RNAs. So what was known about SNO RNAs is that these are an intriguing class of non-coding RNAs defined primarily by their length and associated motifs. Shown here in the diagram is a classical box CD structure uh, with a kink turn of the uh, RNA itself and several associated proteins, and the RNA has a box C and box D motif. Most of these SNO RNAs and all SNO RNAs in mammalian cells are intronic, and their production is therefore splicing dependent. Across the human genome, there are more than 2,000 established or predicted SNO RNAs. In in mammalian cells um, and, and in, in all organisms, the, the classical function of these RNAs is to form snow ribonucleoproteins in which the snow RNA acts as a guide to target the protein machinery to a target RNA. And it binds the target RNA through a small stretch of antisense homology. One of the proteins then catalyzes a covalent modification of a specific residue within this region. The typical targets for the box CD SNO RNAs are ribosomal RNAs, and the classical modifications are 2 prime O-methylation. Other classes of SNO RNAs bear other motifs and can lead to pseudourinylation or processing of targets. So to discern which gene product out of this locus was responsible for the mutant, we performed a number of complementation studies and targeted knockdown studies in wild type cells. And these led us to the conclusion that the genomic sequence and in fact the snow RNAs were the key portion of the locus whose disruption conferred resistance to lipotoxic cell death. The observation that the mutants were, and the RPL13A mutant in particular, was resistant to more direct inducers of oxidative stress suggests that the SNO RNAs from this locus function downstream of lipid-induced ROS. Interestingly, the metabolic stress that we were generating in our cell culture model caused cytosolic accumulation of these SNO RNAs, which are typically only found in the nucleolus. And this has suggested to us that there could be non-canonical targets for these SNO RNAs outside of the nuclear structure. Interestingly, uh, there were also additional uh, loci discovered in this genetic screen that, that led us to, to 
have further interest in the snow RNAs. Ben Scruggs found that haplo insufficiency of the splicing, uh, spliceosomal protein SMD3 led to lower levels of snow RNAs and thereby protected cells from cell death. Melissa Lee discovered that uh, loss of function or haploinsufficiency of NXF3, an RNA transporter, altered the subcellular localization of snow RNAs and thereby protected against metabolic stress. Our screen also identified a mutant in eukaryotic elongation factor 1A1. And this has suggested that snow RNAs contribute to lipotoxicity through a role that involves translation processes within the cell. So inducing lipotoxicity in cell culture served as a very useful model. Jian Li, a postdoc in the lab, went on to translate this discovery to a mouse model to understand the physiological role of the RPL13A snow RNAs. Knowing the disruption of this locus in uh, in flies and in worms led to an embryonic lethal phenotype. Gian carefully took the approach of using homologous recombination to swap in an ide otherwise identical locus that was simply missing the intronic snow RNAs. From this study, she obtained viable fertile mice with no apparent phenotype at baseline under standard housing and feeding conditions in the FVB background. But qPCR clearly showed that she had disrupted expression of the four snow RNAs while maintaining expression of the messenger RNA, and in data not shown here, maintaining wild type levels of the RPL13 protein. I'll refer to this model now as the RPL13A snowless or knockout mouse. As Jian performed initial metabolic characterization, she noticed that these animals had enhanced glucose tolerance in a glucose tolerance test with data shown here in the graph below the mouse. Um, at the 30 minute time point in the glucose tolerance test, serum insulin levels were increased. This led Jian to focus in on the pancreas. A careful morphometric analysis showed that there was no change in beta cell mass in these animals. Animals. But when Jian isolated the islets, she found that in response to stimulatory concentrations of glucose, these islets secreted more insulin. On the other hand, there were no differences in insulin secretion in response to potassium chloride or globenclamide. And this suggested to Jian that there was a very interesting metabolic phenotype. Uh, we know that uh, Metabolism of glucose upstream of the KATP channel generates metabolic coupling factors that regulate insulin secretory machinery in beta cells. So Gian used X seahorse extracellular flux analysis to actually quantify glucose metabolism in the wild type and RPL13A snowless islets. Here you can see that under low basal glucose concentrations, oxygen consumption was indistinguishable between the genotypes. But when she raised the ambient glucose concentrations to 20 millimolar, there was a dramatic separation of the data. The oxygen consumption rate at basal levels and maximal levels was increased in the RPL13A snowless islets. Thus, mitochondrial metabolism was altered, and this was brought out by stressful or metabolic stress conditions in these islets. So ultimately, our interest was in discerning whether or not disruption of this gene could protect against lipotoxicity. And here, the ACS model that I described at the beginning of my talk proved to be very useful. Gian crossed this model with the RPL13A snowless mouse um, and examined these mice in several ways. Here I show data from echocardiography showing um, this fractional shortening is a measure of systolic function. Compared to wild type animals, the ACS here shows you depressed cardiac function or depressed fractional shortening. And this was largely rescued by knockout of the RPL13A snow RNAs. Concomitant with this, survival was partially improved in the mice bearing knockout of the snow RNAs. So this suggested that loss of function of the snow RNAs in vivo could protect against lipotoxic injury and its physiologic consequences. 
So given that metabolic uh, metabolism of glucose was altered in the knockout, this led Dujian to specifically look at fatty acid metabolism in these animals. And here we see the results of a C11 palmitate biodistribution in which animals are injected with the tracer and five minutes later euthanized to examine uptake of the tracer into various tissues. Although there were no differences across the genotypes and uptake of the tracer in the lungs and other organs in the hearts, there was a similar increase in uptake of the tracer, whether or not the snow RNAs were present. And this suggested that disruption of the snow RNAs had not impaired the ability of the heart to take up metabolic substrate. However, metabolic studies in permeabilized isolated cardiac fibers showed that here too, there was increased oxygen oxygen consumption in the absence of the RPL13A snow RNAs using fatty acid substrates, both under basal and maximal conditions. So together, our data indicate that protection from lipotoxicity is associated with profound changes in oxidative metabolism. The canonical function of the RPL13A snow RNAs is to direct 2 primo methylation on the 18S and 28S ribosomal RNAs. Jamie Reimer worked with Jian Li to explore the consequences of disruption of the snow RNAs on ribosome structure and function. Total ribosome R ribosomal RNA mass was unchanged, and our overall rates of protein synthesis were indistinguishable between the wild type and the mutant. Jamie went on to use a primer extension PCR, PCR analysis to analyze the known RPL13A directed sites of 2 prime O methylation on the 18S and 28S ribosomal RNAs. This technique takes advantage of the steric hindrance to reverse transcription processivity that is caused by the modification. In this assay, more qPCR product indicates less steric hindrance and hence less methylation, whereas less qPCR product indicates more steric hindrance and hence more methylation. As you can see here, at sites for each of the snow RNAs, there was less methylation in the knockout animal. Thus, the expected changes in the ribosomal RNA were present in the knockout model. So to summarize what I've told you so far, under conditions of metabolic stress, and in particular lipid excess, we can observe cell death and tissue damage, whether it's in cell culture or in experimental animals, and this is supported by observational evidence in human studies. Knockout of the RPL13A snow RNAs abrogates cell death and tissue damage and leads to metabolic rewiring. What are the molecular links between the RPL13A snow RNAs and these metabolic changes? These are areas of active ongoing exploration in our lab. What I can tell you is, is that mitochondrial content is not increased in these models. And we cannot find evidence that altered mTOR signaling underlies the metabolic rewiring. We've also looked carefully at gene expression in a variety of tissues using RNA-seq, and we find no evidence for substantial al significant alterations in either transcriptional or splicing programs. Rather, we hypothesize that snow RNA loss impacts specifically the protein machinery for energy metabolism at the level of translation. And preliminary studies using both proteomics and ribosome profiling suggest that this will be a productive avenue for investigation. Our work is ongoing to define the molecular targets for the RPL13A snow RNAs in this pathway. Uh, it may be possible that subtle changes to the ribosome, as I've shown you in this model, may reflect the cause of the metabolic rewiring, and that's an interesting possibility given interest in ribosomal heterogeneity and its impact on gene expression. But it is also possible that these snow RNAs could have other non-canonical targets. And we are intrigued by the possibility that some of those targets could be in the cytoplasm. More broadly, our findings have sparked our interest in studying other examples of crosstalk between lipid metabolism and translation. Furthermore, knowing that there are more than 2,000 snow RNAs across the genome, we are curious as to whether other snow RNAs are linked to metabolism. And finally, we are interested in determining whether genetic variation in snow RNAs can be linked to phenotypic variability in human metabolism. 
Finally, none of this work would have been possible without the outstanding teams I've been privileged to work with. In today's talk, I've highlighted contributions from alumni of our lab at Washington University in St. Louis. Since moving to Harvard last year, I've recruited an amazing group of talented young scientists who are carrying these projects forward. I would also like to thank the wonderful mentors who helped to shape my career path, beginning as an undergraduate with Matthew Messelson and Richard Morimoto at Harvard, and subsequently as a postdoctoral fellow with Harvey Lodish at MIT. I am grateful to the NIH for support of this work, and I would like to end once again by thanking the ASBMB for the incredible honor of the Avanti Award this year. Thank you.